here. And um, yeah, so this is um, like a little workshop I, I um, do in other shapes and forms as well, but I kind of repackage specifically for this occasion where I uh, first of all give a little rundown of the system. So you also maybe lose the, those of you who are not really kind of gotten into modular synthesis yet, lose the fear that it's all too complicated. And those who already know maybe also get some inspiration. And then later on I do a second part where I'm going to run through three of my favorite types of modules. And yeah, basically we will look at one oscillator, we will look at a function generator and a, 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 a sequencer. So you have basically the three building blocks that you, can, that you need to make, make sound with, but also very specific to the modular system that you can see how inspiring it can be to work with this. And I thought instead of just having everything set up in the first place, I'm gonna do it together with you and I can run you through the system. So it's also very easy, I think, once you understand what each module does to follow the performance. So essentially, this is a 104 unit wide case and it's six units deep. So this is the kind of standard measure for a modular synthesizer, three units is the, the height of the, of the module. So this is kind of my physical limitation. When I'm going on the road and I'm playing live, I'm confined to the system. I travel also with bigger systems and they have all kind of uh, trouble. I mean, this one fits into the overhead um, uh, compartment in the airplane and I have a bigger one that fits as well, but it's too heavy. So I often had to, or I, I, I had once had to end up at the airplane to screw out the modules and put them in the suitcase. So that also didn't prove to be very practical. And I also find this is like the ideal kind of dimension to really play, get, play it as an instrument because the real cool thing about the module is like almost every module has one knob per function so you don't really need to look and you can feel your way and that's also why I like this for a live performance because I can interact or I can see what's going on on the dance floor or what, how the audience is reacting and there's not a screen kind of uh, creating a distance so this is that was kind of my motivation to do this and I had to go through several iterations so every time I'm going on the road it's slightly different and this is what you see here is what I prepared specifically for the show yesterday at the oil club in Shenzhen. So what I usually do is there's a, a website called Modular Grid and it allows you to, it's like a little dollhouse and you can put all your modules and then you can see do they fit, do they um, match the power consumption because each of these cases has a power supply built inside. So you need to be careful of, uh, of these specs and then also obviously the alignment that it feels natural to play it. And then once you got this done, the sketch, then you sit down, you unscrew all the modules, you put them back in together, and I play with it for a while, and I realize, ah, that's not working again, and then it's back to the drawing board, rearranging, and then eventually something comes out that works. And this is um, kind of my, was my final design for the, for the tour this time. And then it, it's down to really practicing and understanding the intricacies and what you can do with it. So just the, the philosophical aspect of it. And in terms of the technical uh, aspect, I have basically three voices. So I have the DPO, it's a dual prismatic oscillator. It's like a really, really good sounding analog, fully analog oscillator based on the West Coast principle. And the cool thing is, is it ha has two oscillators that can operate in tandem, or I can also um, you know, have each of them tap, tap uh, the, uh, the uh, different waveforms separately, so I have a lot of colors of sound with this simple module. So that's why I, I like to, to bring this and I, it's one of those oscillators I've been using for a long time and I really know my way around it very well and c what kind of sound I'm getting out of it I can predict very well. So that's why I love this one. And then this is my, my third voice, if you count these as individual oscillators. It's a Mysteron and I, I love this one because when I first bought it I really couldn't get any sound out of it I liked. And it took me a good year to get anything where I felt like this is even remotely what I want, you know. But the more I fought with it, the more I got to a point where I really got like a very personal um, sound out of it. And it's great. It's kind of like a, it's a, a specific synthesis um, technique. It's called a waveguide, where it's not using like a standard oscillator, which um, uh, 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 oscillates at a specific frequency, but instead it works like a feedback. It's a short feedback loop. And by changing the length of the feedback, you change the pitch of the tone and the sound you get out of it is like if you would hit a piano string with a hammer. It's a very interesting kind of um, 
uh, very interesting frequency spectrum that kind of sounds very different to a classic uh, analog oscillator. So that's why I think that these are two good modules and both I can play either melodically or also very rhythmically. So I can almost do like a little drum, like a drum voice with these three um, voices here. Then I have uh, the MAFs as my envelope generator that opens and closes my um, my uh, um, VCA. So I'm using the Optimix here. This is a, I love this a lot because it uses um, a component called Vectrol. It's a specific uh, component that reacts in a very musical way. It's not a very, it's not a fast VCA, so it doesn't close. It's not super lightning fast, but it has a very musical response. And what's also cool is it. But it, it diminishes both the overtones and the volume over the course of the of the duration of or the, depending on the voltage. So you get a very nice natural response. You know the sound doesn't only get uh, quieter, but also the overtones get reduced. So that's why I love this one a lot. Then to the right, this is kind of my my loop section. So I got um, the Erica synth Pico input. This is um, necessary for getting the signals from my octa track into the modular system because standard line levels they are too low so you actually need to boost them to modular level which is what I'm doing here and I'm doing a little old school trick by only running one stereo cable from the octa track and I'm splitting one channel to the left and one to the right I basically get two channels out of this yeah? two mono channels because if I'm playing in the club stereo orientation isn't that good anyway so I also prepare, pr prefer to have things mono and rather add stereo effects with my voices then. And then this is, I run this into this um, uh, module here by Eowave, which is, I really searched very long and it's the only module that's currently on the market that I know of that does what I needed to do because basically I send each of the loops, the individual loops I get from the octa track into one channel of this um, multi-mode filter. So basically it's two inputs so it's like a, it's, it's like a stereo filter but you can operate it as a low pass and a high pass for each channel and i come from a dj background so this paradigm that you can low cut the track and mix it in and then you can also play with the with the top end that was something very important to me and this is a module that allows me to do that in the modular realm so i can have each i can mix in the, the loops cut out the low end filter them slowly in and it's kind of like as I would DJ, that's that was the basic idea. So it's the only module I could find that would actually do that. Yeah, how many channels is that? So basically, you have two inputs, and then they they get processed through two filters each. But you can also run all four in in, in series. So you got like a four-pole crazy filter if you want to. But I'm really using it for low cut. So it's a high-pass filter, low-pass filter. So this way I can you know bring in a loop without taking too much of the lower spectrum, and then kind of reversing this like as, as it would be as a, would as a DJ and then I could also filter it out and kind of create very smooth transitions. So this is kind of owed to my, my DJ background because I felt when I play these live shows I still want to have this feeling you know to build up energy and to make these smooth transitions between the different um, ideas I'm working on. So that's why this one is very important. I had to pull off the knobs here because it's very difficult. The, these, I like these Rogan style knobs that make, make noise I'm using because in the dark you can see very easily the orientation but with this one it's a real pain and I realized I often was working on the wrong knob so I just decided to get rid of them. So this is more for practical purposes. Now on the lower um, row we have on the left hand side the Squab Hermod. This is like um, uh, if you really in, a, in very simple ways it's like a a MIDI to CV converter. So I got signal, a MIDI signal coming in from the octa track in here and this basically spits out different gates. That's all I'm using it for. So I have the loops coming in here and then I have the synchronization to the rest of the system coming from the Hermod. So I have clocks running the individual um, uh, the in individual instruments or sequencers or modules and I can also have different clock speeds. So this is really like, I use it very much as a utility module. It's very deep, it has a built-in sequence, so you have MIDI effects. I'm not using any of this in this configuration. It's really just to kind of get both worlds together. And then this here, this, this next module is also something I like a lot. It's a Wogglebug. It's a, it's a very old um, design by Grant Richter. 
I think I believe from the 70s even, and this adds a little bit chaos in the system. So there's like a, I think it's like a, a pink noise or a brown noise that is being sampled and then spit out at either smooth or like a stepped CV signal. And I can patch this into various points in the system to get not, not like it's not random because there's some kind of interaction between the individual outputs but it gives me a little bit variation so I don't have to worry about constantly dialing new values but this little thing does it for me and you can also freeze it so when you like a, a sound you can just push the button and it holds that value so you get like the you can play it almost you can interact with it and it also has a tendency to go a little bit crazy sometimes which is also cool because you never know what's going to happen so this is quite important and this here is really the kind of brain of the whole operation. This is the Rene. This is the second uh, version they released. I just bought this recently. I had the first Rene was one of my very first sequences. And we're also going to look at this one later in detail because I think it's really an amazing module that's super rewarding. It's very, it looks a little bit intimidating, but once you understand the basic principle, you can get the most amazing uh, kind of um, ideas out of this. And that's why I always say like the modular, that's my musical sparring partner. So I set parameters and then I listen to what it does and I say ah, I like this and then I record it so that's why the, all these modules that add a little bit chaos to this to the to the to the result is, is always something I appreciate and then here on the right side we have the echo phone which is my um, delay of choice I wish I could have um, like a little bit more options to filter it beforehand you will notice later on when I go in with a full frequency signal sometimes also it eats into the main signal coming from the loop so at the moment, I'm a little bit pressed for space here. Yeah, I think next time I'm coming back, I will have a, a little bit uh, different arrangement to cut down some modules that are not so essential. And then I will have more options to play with this because this is really, I use it a lot like a, like a, a tool to also build. So I can you know, use it to just get a little bit, inject a, a specific element into the delay. And then I can freeze the delay. And then this starts to become like almost a separate rhythm or like a separate kind of percussive element. And I can use that to build up and then I can filter the loops out and in. So this is, this is a really great tool. Plus it also has a pitch shifting functionality. So it, you can change the, 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 um, the pitch of the buffered uh, or the frozen buffer. So you can do all kinds of crazy things with this. So this is, this is a lot of fun to use. And then here I have another VCA kind of... Uh, more out of necessity because what happens is I get the loops from the input signal coming in here into the filter and then they have to go in here because I need to control the volume independently because these knobs you can't CV them, the, the volume knob, the signal input. Um, so I have the signal going into here out of the filter because what I do is I use um, one of these devices, it's a simple USB uh, MIDI device and I connect it with the uh, Expert Sleeper's fader host. And the fader host is nothing but a module that translates the uh, signals it receives over the USB port into CV values. And you can program this. Uh, it's quite cumbersome. They now have a new version with a little screen. It's very easy to edit. But in essence, what it does is like if I move a fader, you see that very first um, output here, it basically sends a CV value. And you can define exactly how much uh, how much voltage it should output, you can invert signals and so on. So it's a very, very useful tool. And basically what I do is I would just patch out um, these jacks, for instance, to the um, jack that control the volume here. So now I'm able, if you see the lights here, this is the output volume of the VCA. By moving this slider, I send the MIDI data here, this converts it into CV, so an, uh, like a, a voltage and then allows me to change the volume on this particular model, uh, module. So in essence what I then do is I just plug in the output of, the, of this filter into here. I would then um, just kind of reversing the, the signal flow for a moment. I take the output from this module and then get it into the input here. And as a last step, I use the summed output. So that's very useful for a small format system. Each of these modules has a, um, uh, an output where all the, the, these two channels are combined. So what I can do is I can mix down these two loop channels into this module, and then I just plug it in into ROSI. And ROSI is kind of like my output module. It has like a DJ kind of blender between two inputs. Plus you have a return signal, which is where 
I usually plug in my um, my echo phone, so I can also control the, the the signal of the delay independently of the to the signals I have coming in here. And what's cool is you even have a headphone output, so I can pre-listen when the other artist is performing. Is everything going as it should be? Even though I don't usually use that throughout the performance. So this is kind of where everything ends up going out to the to the front. So this is kind of just the, the very general setup. OctaTrack I really use as a very simple loop playback device. I have two decks set up, deck one and deck five. And um, basically what I do is I load um, loops in there and then I have set up something called track triggers that allows me to tr uh, trigger and then start the track in time with the, with the tempo. It's similar if you're familiar with, with Ableton, it's a similar paradigm so that I don't have to worry about uh, b the beat aligning to the to the beat phase, so this is very precise. And I went through many different um, applications, and also I, at first I was looking for something where I could trigger the loops directly from the from the um, modular. And there's a bunch of um, applications, but the problem is none of them are precise enough. So I really had to do very precise testing because the the, tr the loops would drift in and out of phase, and it was really really. Um, kind of, uh, I felt very insecure because I really didn't understand why, when something was went wrong, it, why it went wrong. And I was doing a lot of researching and writing to the developers and they would also sometimes fix bugs, but in the end it never really worked in, well enough that I was confident. So now I found this one and for the, for the time being this is really uh, something I, I enjoy because it just does the job I'm asking it to do. It's also a very deep machine, but I'm not using it for anything but to play the samples. Yeah, add something sure. about the track yes. with modular. It also works as a great mixer for modular because you can adjust the gain level. You can turn the gain down, mm -hmm. so you can bring modular level to line level with the inputs. Ah, okay, when you use the inputs, yeah. yeah? Okay. So it's also, like, you can use it as an effects processor for True. modular, yeah. Yeah, it's really uh, universal that you can yeah. do so many In different things. People want to I use a similar setup, so okay. it's really useful for them. Good to know. Yeah. Cool, so this is kind of like the very basic um, setup. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to kind of follow through what I explained to you. So now what I set up here now is I, this is what I call, you can see like a little, got a little labeling. So this is the volume, high pass filter, low pass filter. This is the volume of the DPO. And this is then for the second channel. So I'm just going to kind of move along this paradigm. So the second output here then goes into the modulation for the filter. This is the you can see this is set to high pass. So now when I move this one up, the filter will also go up. Same way I'm going to do this thing here for the low pass filter. So now with this lever going up and down, I can control the low pass for this particular channel. And now with the last channel here, I'm controlling the volume of the DPO. This is a little bit tricky because I have to, um, I'm using the mass for this, so I will explain this to you later because this is a quite complicated module, but in essence I'm using the mixer here to generate a control voltage that allows me to lower the volume of the uh, of the DPO going into this VCA here. VCA, voltage controlled oscillator, if, you, if any term sounds weird to you just let me know because sometimes I'm just so used to that, um, that kind of um, uh, terminology. Okay, so now this is the first channel we have set up. Everything is, is running. I need to connect this submixer here to the first input or the input A on the ROSI. So now when I go to the right, I have the signals from the two um, loop channels coming from the OctaTrack. And when I go to the left, I have the signals coming from the DPO and from the Misteron. So Misteron output goes into the input here for the um, DPO. You can choose different waveforms. I'm just going to plug the final output. This is the one where you have most control over the timbre. I will also explain this later. So now we have voice A, we have voice B going in here. Is that correct? Yeah. Voice B going into here. And um, actually the Misteron doesn't need a VCA. It has kind of like a built-in, uh, sorry, it doesn't need an, uh, uh, an envelope. It has a built-in uh, way to shorten or lengthen the signal so I can actually play with it and Again, this saves me a little bit space. So this one just goes straight into here. And the um, volume of the Misteron from the mixer is controlled just like this. So when I'm using this, um, this lever here, 
it sends control voltage into this input, so then I have still control in one place. I can change the vo uh, set up the volume for the two loops coming from the octa track. I can control the filter and I can control the volume of my two voices. So that's the, that's the basic idea that I have all the controls that are really time sensitive in one place. I can cut the filter and the volume, and so this is why I why I use this. Uh, this option, you know, I could also be in here, but I'm ju it's just not fast enough, especially for the music, you know, that I'm doing, which is quite high tempo. So this is why, at the moment, this is a very good solution for me. Okay, so we got all this of set up, have all this set up. Now we're going to connect the um, Hermod. And one last thing to the octa track, you have basically two layers. You have an audio layer and you have a MIDI layer. So in the MIDI layer, what it does is it basically allows you to send eight signals to the over MIDI, or even more possibly, but at least you have these eight tracks here. So when, now when I press play, and I have everything set up correctly, not the you other way. You only use the sliders and the launch control. Exactly, yeah. You, you could use much more. I mean, in theory, you can also have an expander for this one. Mm -hmm. And then you have, each expander has another eight outputs. So in theory, you could also address all these, you know, and then control even more functions. But at the moment, this is really the most time sensitive for me, these functions I have here on the sliders. And I like also another thing, with one glance of an eye, you can see what's going on. You know, you can see, ah, the volume here is up, high pass filters down, low pass filters is up. So that means the track should be audible, fully audible. So that's why it's also a very good uh, system when you're in a club and sometimes things get hectic and maybe things get a little crazy, you still see what's going on, if, if no sound is coming out. Because there's a million reasons why no sound should come out, you know. So now, just to show you what I've done, I, I hit play, and now basically the Hermod is getting the MIDI signal from the Octa track, and now you can see these lights blink here. And these are basically my clock signals, and you can see there's like a certain pattern, like one, two, four, and th these are getting uh, eighth note uh, triggers, this one gets a, a quarter note, or it's, no, it's the 16th, I don't know, let's have a look. Yeah, it's, it's eighth note and quarter note, and these ones are at far less regular intervals. So if I stop, you will see the three and five blink. Yeah, so I, I use this as a reset signal. And a little trick also I developed over the time is I tried to make everything very simple and very easy to remember, because it's really difficult to set something like this up in a dark club, and there's a DJ playing in front of you. So one trick I like to use is I always try to um, follow an order. For instance, in this case, I know I have to just set up the gates in the order from left to right to the modules. So for instance, I know I need to clock the woggle bug, so output one, the woggle bug is the closest module here, so I just plug that in here. Then I know, okay, the next one will be the X clock of my sequencer. So I know this one goes in there. And I know this next one will be the reset for the X clock. So you see, even if you're maybe, if you had a beer or something, you should be able to get that together. So that's that's a really important strategy. Okay, now just following that principle. So sorry, I'm, I'm um, not familiar with the Octatrack. So mm -hmm. it's pumping out MIDI, so everything's in sync, but what are these divisions? So basically... Is, oh, is that coming from the Octatrack? Yeah, so a good, good question actually. So let's look at track one. So I, in, I uh, selected track one. Now when I hit record, you see the, the accents it's sending out. So these are just trigger signals. Okay. If I select track two, it's the same. Track three, you see it only sends one track over the course of 64 um, steps, you know? So this is why you will see different kind of divisions blinking on your track, because I set it up manually. So you set up sequences exactly. as effective clock divisions. Exactly, yes, because I also experimented. You can also say, okay, I want to clock here with that division, but I found this is much more flexible, because this way all the timing comes from this machine. This doesn't actually receive clock. You know, I also, you can also clock this and then use that to have like MIDI delays and stuff like that. But I felt like keeping it really simple helped me to also understand when something wasn't going as it was intended to. Okay, so now just moving forward, always in the uh, horizontal direction. And now the last one I need to connect is the, um, the clock for the echo phone. Going here into the tempo and now Hermod is connected. Wogglebug is something that I always decide on the spot, so I'm just going to leave those open for the time being. I'm going to step, uh, have one in the step, then one in the smooth voltage, and this way I can basically decide which, which parameters I want to con connect them. I'll leave them out for now. Now, as I said, this is the sequencer that generates the notes for the 
for the um, voices to play. So I have two full uh, sets for the X and for, it's basically generating two independent sets of control voltages for pitch and for trigger. So I'm making use of that by plugging in the, um, the first layer, the X layer, CV, meaning the, 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 the pitch goes into the one volt per octave on the DPO. So this way, when it generates a note, it will send the node value or the, the, the corresponding uh, control voltage to the DPO. So this will play the notes generated by the X channel. And now I want to open and close the gate by the X, uh, based on the triggers from the X channel. So I'm taking this X gate and I'm just going to trigger the maths. So whenever a note is being played here, the, t the pitch goes here, the information a note has been played goes there, and then what math does is depending how I set up these um, these uh, uh, controls here, it, gener it opens the volume for that particular channel uh, for that particular sound for for a while. Yeah. So it's, this is the paradigm that the pitch and the, the the trigger information is disconnected from one another, which you can use for very interesting musical purposes, which I'll show you in a minute. So this is the information for the DPO, and now I have to set up the same thing for the Misteron. I have to send a note information to the Misteron, which goes straight into pitch. As I said, it's a bit of an odd module that, because it doesn't operate like a standard oscillator, and that's why I also don't need to have um, open the um, VCA. Well, I don't. I don't need a, an envelope for this because I need to strike the um, the Misteron. So you have to imagine you have to hit the hammer on the string. So that's when when the, when the Y voice is generating a note, it sends the pitch information here and bangs the, 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 the um, delay line, so this way this module generates a sound. Yeah? Again, this is very, it's a bit esoteric, so don't worry if, if you don't get this straight away, but it's just important to understand you always have note information and information, okay, now a new note has been played. So this is always CV and gate. Are those two connected, the, the GPO and the, the MATS? Yeah. The, the trigger is going to... Exactly. So check this out. So the output of the voice goes in the top channel of the Optimix, right? This is which controls the volume of that sound. And the, the, um, the, the kind of instance that decides how to set the volume is the maths, which is why the gate from the X voice goes into here. And now, for instance, if I... If I um, you see this? When I, when I hit a note, this is when the light blinks. And this is basically for that instance, it opens the channel on the Optimix. And then this goes here and lets the sound through. Yeah? So that's exactly as you, as you saw, this is the signal flow. This is the audio and this is the control over the voltage. Okay, so this is now set up. The last thing we need to do is have, um, get a signal into the echo phone and there's several ways how to do this. I could either get the send, so that means everything that's playing is sent to it, but what's also really cool and what I appreciate about these two modules is they have separate outputs. So we are using the main output which sums the two signals, but I can still plug in, for instance, in the top channel, and now this signal is being tapped into the echo phone. So this way I can choose between four individual signals to be fed directly into the, into the delay. Yeah, so this is kind of like also really nice for the performance. So as it stands, I would say, ah, hold on, we still have to connect those. So just using the similar approach, this will be the volume for my second loop. I'm going there. Then I also still need to connect the output, the second loop output going into my filter. Going from the filter into the VCA, the uh, voltage controlled amplifier, so now I have both loops ending up here. And the last thing I still need to do, I need to set up these two channels which control the low pass and the high pass filter. Again, this is just for performance reason. You wouldn't necessarily have to do this if you were kind of just playing with the modular, but this is really what I prefer when I'm in a dark club to have everything together. Okay, so this is the process. And if I'm, if I'm on a good night, it takes me five minutes. If I'm on a bad night, it takes me 20 minutes. And if I'm lucky, in the end, sound comes out. So let's see what happens. So the process is usually I just um, go through my library of loops and then I select one. So we have to do maybe a little sound check. Ah, okay, another thing, actually, because these are analog oscillators, 
you might have to tune them. So this is also like a, a process I need to do usually at the beginning of the night. So I'm just going to briefly unplug the volume control. So this way we can um, listen to the oscillator on its own. Yeah, this is the synthesizer voice. Just going to use a very natural one. I'm not, I, I still have a lot of volume here, so I just don't want to blast you with the sine waves. And now this is a C I have, because the, the idea is that the, the Rene sends additive volt, uh, voltages to the pitch. So you want to set the absolute lowest bass frequency and then this adds pitch to it. Yeah? So that's why I'm using a C1. I know from my experience this is, this is kind of like as low as it gets in a club. And now I just have to... So this actually goes over 10 octaves, so it's a bit tricky to set up. Well, that's about right. And I do the same thing with the second oscillator. Any of you play guitar? So then you know the drill. Mm -hmm. It's just the same. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Now I have them both in tune. And what's kind of cool about the DPO is as well, it shows you here with this little blinking light the beating between the two oscillators. So you can see now the, blink, the, the beating increases. So it shows the relative uh, pitch difference between oscillator A and oscillator B. Okay, I can live with that. So let's just quickly replug. Putting that back in here. All right, now that should silence it. Okay, so this is set up. We have everything going uh, as we want to. I might um, uh, set up a quick sequence here for the for the um, for the rain name. And what's also kind of important is I like since it's important. This is musical information, so to know which key the songs are in. So I always know which key the loops are in. I'm working with. So for instance, the first track I'm going to play is an F. So I can actually go to the quantizer page. Quantizer page means it takes the continuous voltage that comes out from the, from the Rainy, from the sequencer, and steps this or, or uh, kind of confines this to specific voltages that represent musical values from scale. Yeah? So I know this is an F minor tune, so I can now select from this quantizer page only notes that are related to F minor. So if you, I don't know if you can see this, but basically you have 12 buttons here that represent the 12 keys in a musical scale. So it starts with C and ends with a B. So now, for instance, if I have a tune that goes in F, I might first set up only the F and the C and the A flat. So I have the root, the fifth, the minor third, just the very strong intervals. Or if I really want to kind of feel it out, see where, where I'm going with this, I might only use the root. So that's a nice way to first play with the timbre and see where we're headed. And what then happens is that each of these buttons confines to only the notes I set up here. And additionally, you can select over how many octaves you want this to be. So this is one octave, two octaves, three octaves, four octaves. So for instance, now I could show you, I have this set to F. Okay. You're not hearing anything because this comes out there. See, this is now just we have the root. And if I were to go back into the quantizer and select like a different configuration now, having my, maybe like a minor third. Yeah, so now I only have these notes. And now I can decide for each of these notes which ones I want to represent which, which note, which pitch, right? So each of these, uh, uh, of these controls now holds a specific pitch value that I decided before in the quantizer. So this way I can, you know, have, have different sequences. OK, 
Okay, like that. Now I have like a little array of nodes that I that I already created. Now let's patch that back in that we have stopped the drone. Okay. Now I'm just going to start the playback, and the first thing you will hear is the is the track itself, the loop, and then I will start to do a little improvisation, starting something with the DPO, adding a little bit with the Mister on, just so. Ah, oh, hey, good to see you. So just to, that you get a feel to how I would use the, the sequencer in addition to the, to the loops I'm working with. And it's really like I'm improvising on top of the loop. It's not that I'm completely creating everything from scratch, but I'm trying to kind of um, embellish it and take it to other places and loop certain parts of the, of the composition. So this is the, my basic uh, idea. Okay, so let's see what, what comes out of here. Okay, it works. That's a, it's a nice thing when the sound comes out straight away. So here, this is the volume for the track. This is what I said. It's the filter. This is the high pass. And now with this, I can slowly bring this one in.
Thank you. So I guess you get the idea. It's it's kind of like a, a a system for me. I like to say to keep myself entertained, you know, because I can play music because it's all my own productions or co-productions. But I can add something on top of this, and I can take the tracks into directions that were maybe not originally intended in the production. But I can extend them or I can shorten them and just kind of you know add layers on top that I might not have thought of in the studio. So that's the, the general purpose of how I'm using the system. Okay, um, so that was based, when you say loop, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a newbie, right? So right. When you say loop, you mean the entire track? Right. I can do different variations. For instance, I some, sometimes I can just bring in the drums, I can bring in the bass. You know, I have like stems of the track. Okay, you have like sub loops. In exactly. The Exactly. And then on the fly, then you can switch back to those sublips. Exactly. So That's the I, second channel that you run through. So, for instance, on the same channel, even yeah. I could select. Okay, now I have the full track running, but yeah. I only want to have the drums now. You yeah. know. So I just load this in and then just trigger it on time, and then it comes in. You know. Right. So this way, I can have like different variations and also different depths of how much I want to alter the track. You know. Right. Because sometimes I also just want to let the tracks run and just add like a little right. few effects to it, you know, not to go crazy because it's a fine line, you know, feeling like you have to do something and sometimes people just want to listen to the music as it is, you know. Sure, sure. And I guess if, let's say there's not so many people around you, mm -hmm. plenty of time, you can go to the breakdown. Exactly. You just around the breakdown for 15 minutes. Exactly, right? yeah. And you can develop this into almost like a new composition, you know. Okay. So that's what I like about the setup that the Octatrack allows me to have break down the, the song into different like almost like vertical layers mm -hmm. and I can decide do I want to play the full thing do I maybe want to bring the bass from one tune, tune play that with the drums of the another tune you know just best practices when you write music you have to always make sure you export them in stems so that you have access to the individual musical elements how about the, the Rene? Are you playing that on the fly every time mm -hmm. you yes. play a gig? So you're programming on it? Yes, and mm -hmm. honestly I think it really works well with the, the second Rene that they say it's like, you know, like a, it's supposed to be programmed in real time and at first I was a bit hesitant because the, the, the initial version of the Rene was more complicated in that sense. But um, there's a couple of techniques that I'll also show a, a little bit later where you can really kind of feel your way through and it's not that you know, the, 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 the kind of um, border between programming and performance disappears. So there's like this latch function, for instance, where you press certain keys or certain touch plates and then on the kind of sequence is only confined to those, you know, and you can get very interesting variations, almost like the sequence is looping and then you touch again, boom, and you go back into the sequence. So this way you can get very interesting, small kind of uh, yeah, variations that it doesn't almost feel like it's a, a continuous running sequence. And then if you combine this, for instance, with a bit of randomness from the Wogglebug, then also for me it's fun to listen to. So I often have this feeling, like, yeah man, that's really nice, I enjoy hearing that. I don't necessarily feel like I'm doing it only myself, you know? So this is kind of uh, the fun part for me, where I feel, really feel like I'm getting myself a little bit out of the process and, and also enjoying being in the, in the situation. So that's kind of, at first I was doing like, having setups where everything was super, confined and I had to be on top of things every second and that was also not enjoyable for me. So with this, this thing right now, I can have this thing jamming and I just have to be careful sometimes not to forget, oh, okay, now I need to do something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm enjoying myself too much. Cool. cool. Okay, so this was kind of just to get an understanding of how I'm using the modules, but the beautiful thing is that everybody can use them in a different way. So for this, maybe we want to switch over to the, to the, um, slides I brought along because um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tear the whole thing apart quickly because that will also help me to demonstrate the, the, the um, concepts I want to talk about now. See this goes much much quicker than the other way around. <laughs> What's your color coding system? Um, actually it's just based on length. I know, I know people who actually separate it like this is audio, this is control voltage, okay. but uh, I just bought them in packs 
and the, the color was based on the length, so I kind of run with it. And it is a little bit of a help that you know I, I need a really long one. I know it's the, the blue ones. Some of them I'm a, quite colorblind, so I can't see the difference between that one and this one. Can anybody else? Okay, but they're apparently different colors. Okay, so now we have a blank slate again. And as I said, I want to talk about three of my favorite modules. And it's not necessarily these modules per se, but it's more like the concept of them that you can also find in many other modules. So, um, see, does it work? Do you guys receive something? All right. Okay, I'm, am I switching it or are you doing it? Nobody knows. Hello. Okay, can you just switch to the next one with the... All right, so that's me in my studio. I thought I'd show you where how I operate. So this is like my, my room with all my gear. I have a lot of vintage uh, keyboards and synthesizers, so they're like a really important part of my production. But if you go to the next one, that's kind of like my modular, which is, as I said, it's also a big uh, source of inspiration for me. So I'm, I'm really um, using that a lot for my, for my productions. So the first um, kind of module I want to talk about is the complex oscillator. And this is um, kind of the type of oscillator you see right here. It's the, it's, in this case, it's called the, the DPO, the Dual Prosthetic Oscillator. But maybe you can show the next slide. Because this is actually the one where it all came from. This is the Buchler 259. So it's built in 1970. So this was kind of like a real genius, Don Buchler. He was a, a, a kind of inventor on the West Coast who, re, who kind of questioned all musical paradigms. So, when we talk about West Coast and East Coast synthesis, we have almost like this uh, synonymous with Don Buchler and Robert Moog. You know, Moog creating the, the subtractive synthesizer where you have, it's um, kind of very attractive for piano players and it's also very easy to understand the process because in subtractive synthesis what you do is you take a waveform that's very rich in harmonics. Yeah? For instance, if you listen to um, a, a waveform like the, the um, sawtooth, it has a very distinct overtone spectrum. Whereas if you listen to a sine wave, it almost has no overtones. Yeah? So this is kind of what Bob Moog made use of. He took an uh, overtone rich uh, waveform and then you could shape the sound with a filter. You know? And then you, f you, take, you carve out either a bit of the top end or the low end. So it's very easy for everybody to grasp that concept that, okay, this is how I make the sound. Whereas, um, Don Buchler, he had a completely different approach. He even called this the programmable complex waveform generator. So it's not even an oscillator, but you are free to generate your own waveforms. And this is the principle of West Coast synthesis, it's the complete opposite. You start with a very overtone, uh, or like very, um, a very few overtones in the waveform, like this, and then by processes of wave folding, you can add overtones. And you get really amazing kind of variations in the waveform that you could, with filters and other means, it would be very difficult to create something like that. Yeah, so this is a typical West Coast sound. It has the, the wave folding process, what it basically does is when the waveform hits the top, you know, what usually occurs is it clips. That's what you often hear, like when you, when you redline something in a DJ mixer, and then it just takes off the t shaves off the top end, and this creates distortion to a certain degree. But what wave folding does it when it when it reaches the top, instead of being clipped off, it folds back, and it creates these little ripples. Yeah. So and this is what you hear when I'm when I'm folding the wave. Yeah. If you see this on an os oscilloscope, I actually brought a couple of oscilloscope readings later as well. You can see this, and it's really interesting to to get the, the um, parallels there. Maybe you can switch to the next one. So this is now the, the, the Make Noise DPO. If you go to the next slide, this is um, the basic view. 
And at first it looks a little bit intimidating, so I thought we just break it down into, into individual sections. So maybe if you go to the next one. So this is uh, the left side of the module. This is the oscillator A. So as I said, it's two oscillators you're dealing with. Uh, can you go back? Sorry. There we go. So you see on the top you have the waveform outputs. So this oscillator produces three different waveforms. You have the triangle, you have a sawtooth, and you have a sine wave. Then below that you have the frequency knob. As I said, 10 octaves. It's very, a very wide range. And then further down there's one jack that is not uh, within a black square, the one volt per octave. This is where you pitch, uh, patch in the uh, CV information that controls the pitch. Yeah? This, is, this is pretty much the most important jack you need to find if you want to get some sound out of this. And then you have exponential and linear um, FM input. We get into this a little bit later. It's a, a mathematical principle, but um, it's also very interesting for sound shaping. And then below, uh, above that, you see there's three different, there's a, a button that allows you to switch three different modes of operation. So you can either lock, which means you can have um, uh, 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 synchronization with the other uh, oscillator, creating also a very interesting overtones, but it's a separate uh, type of synthesis I don't want to get into because it might be a bit too much. Then you have, um, and then they have the LFO operation. So that's a cool thing. You can either use it as a sound source or you can use this to modulate uh, with, a, with a low frequency other um, uh, kind of destinations in your system. And anybody know the difference between LFO and the regular oscillator? There you go. So it's exactly the same building block because a lot of people are confused what's the difference. But LFO runs up to 20 hertz. That's usually what's considered the control frequency. So we can't hear it, but we can perceive it as a change in values. And then once you get above that, it be just becomes a regular audible oscillator. OK, so now let's look at the oscillator B. As you can see, this is exactly the same, just a little bit simpler on the on the bottom because you don't have the possibility to switch through the different modes. This one only runs on an audible spectrum. And on top you see the three waveforms. You have a sine wave, you have a square wave, and you have what's called the final output. And this is what makes this oscillator so special because this is where the wave folding happens. Maybe you look at the next section. So this is the, the oscillator. You can see the uh, oscilloscope readings. It's quite interesting because it has a special kind of saw. It's almost like a shark fin, that's what it's called, I believe. Very, very clear sign. <coughs> Same thing here. Sign, and we have its next square. And the final I, I reserve for later because this is where all the really complex operations happen. So we can go to the next slide. So this is here the FM section, everything that's related to the FM uh, functionality in the DPO. And basically, you have the possibility to modulate either os the, the frequency of oscillator B with the frequency of oscillator A, or vice versa, or both at the same time. And then you can con control com uh, create complete chaos. So <coughs> FM, in essence, is a, a process where you change the pitch of the the, the audible pitch and normally this is um, perceived as vibrato you know like if you're on the guitar if you're playing guitar and you bend the guitar string you alter the pitch right or if you have an opera singer and they have this vibrato this is also a frequency modulation but it's a slow frequency modulation so once you get over the point where this is perceivable as a change in pitch the ear hears a separate tone coming in yeah this is when you look at the oscilloscope, all of a sudden the frequency splits and you get so-called sidebands. And this is really, really interesting, like really interesting sonically, because you can't really kind of put your finger on it, what kind of sound this is. So, for instance, if you are like a sound designer and you have to make like a bell or like a, a hammer sound or something, it's usually go for frequency modulation, because this gives you very interesting sounds that you can't get with any other uh, synthesis uh, method. Can we move to the next one? So basically I just want to show you um, uh, one of my favorite patches w that's based on frequency modulation. And um, for this we utilize um, these two channels from the DPO. And we actually use the sine wave from the oscillator B. And we use the sine wave because when you frequency modulate a sound, the purer the base, the base um, kind of um, shape of the oscillator, the more controllable these kind of variations of the sound gets. Yeah, so 
This is our standard sine wave we have right now. And now in the middle section, this is the FM section, so you can basically determine how strong, how much amplitude you want to give, how, how much up and down do you want to modulate the pitch. And I can show you this. First of all, I'm going to use oscillator A to modulate the pitch of oscillator B in the LFO range. So this is what you normally would perceive as vibrato. So this is the amount. This is basically hardwired. You don't need to patch anything into it. It would be the same as if I would patch this sine wave output into here. I just have to turn this up and now when I turn up this dial, yeah, it sounds like this is classic LFO modulating the pitch of a voice. Yeah, and you know, or from a police car or like the regular laser. This is all the same principles. Just wee, wee, the sound going up and down, right? Okay, this is not very exciting, but it gets exciting when I get this one back in the audible spectrum and now listen to what first of all what I need to do though is I need to tune them both to the same frequency and I'll talk a little bit about this later so now they're more or less identical and now if I turn this up you will see something happens with the sound <coughs> so I'm just going to uh, use the opportunity to change the, uh, the, the pitch of oscillator 2 and I'm only going to confine it to the root and the fifth. And this is because uh, the, uh, a very basic realization when you use frequency modulation is equal, uh, if you have, um, if you divide it in two, if you divide it in three and four, this gets, it gives very um, uh, pleasant or predictable results. And if you divide it by three or 7.8, then it gets really chaotic. Yeah? So that's why I'm tuning the oscillator two always in integral relationships to oscillator A. So I, sh I showed you already earlier, I can use the uh, quantizer here and I can just set this for instance now to C and to G. And now when I'm... you hear these tones? So I'm just uh, tuning it up in fifth, but the timbre changes every time because oscillator A is modulating oscillator B and the pitch of oscillator A changes and you get this really cool like, uh, like you will often hear in a science fiction movie. This is linear FM what we hear right now. So you can have a very, this is the regular sound without frequency modulation applied. And you see now it gets like this really gritty sound and it's almost like, like a bark to it. This is what exponential FM sound, you hear straight away the pitch drops. Now it gets really crazy. This is difficult to use from very musical applications, but also quite an interesting effect. So I'm just going to show you a really cool uh, patch I like to use, almost like a, like a drum machine. And I use this a lot of my productions, or also like when I'm playing live. For instance, I was um, doing a session with, with D-Bridge and an uh, Austrian artist called Brux at the Red Bull Music Studio. And I was basically using my whole system only as a drum machine. And this was kind of the heart of, the, of, my, um, of my performance, was this FM patch. So, what I'm doing now is I'm just patching the clock. So I have like a clock generator built in here as well. And I'm only controlling the X clock here. That means now Rene will step through the values I determined and then output this here to the DPO. And I'm going to patch this one into the Optimix. So we have also means to, to silence it so that we don't hear it all the time. There we go. And now what I'm doing is every time a trigger is generated, I also want to be able to change the volume of the patch. So just a very simple. See now we get like this little rhythm going. And this is still just a pure sine wave. And the cool thing happens now when I start to dial up the, the linear FM. Now it starts to get a percussive uh, uh, quality. It doesn't sound so much tonal anymore. And um, now, for instance, you can do really cool things to get this more kind of free flow on. So now I'm just taking the stepped ra voltage from the woggle box to get a little bit randomness to it. And you know, this is, this is the FM amount. But I can actually use the woggle box to change this, you know, to add more or less. And this is very, very easy to get. See, now we get these different variations. And I could use another uh, random voltage and change the duration of the note, to not, that not every note has the same duration. 
I can take this one out here, patch it into the fall. This is basically the section of the wave of the envelope where the length is determined. And now, see now each of them has like a different pulse. And that would be like a process where I'm just listening for a while, or I'm just recording, and I will find these 16 bars that are really cool, and then I will turn that into a, like a make it like the backbone of a beat, just add a, like a heavy kick and a heavy snare, and straight away you have a really cool groove. And it just does really nice stuff, you know? And you just have to let it do its job. So this is for me like a really, really nice um, application for frequency modulation where it's really kind of uh, a very unique sound that is hard to define. Like if you would hear it, you wouldn't be able to say what it is, but it just has a special flavor to it, right? So this is like one patch I like to do a lot. This is kind of, I think, a very creative application of FM. Is this, you go into the space when you're creating a tune sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I start from something very simple like this. You can see this is not many cables, but now I can get like really experimental, you know. I can kind of uh, take this to many different places and, um, you know, also play with it, you know. For instance, what I'm doing right now is I'm having um, a sequence running that is actually comprised of nine steps. So it's not a regular eight pattern, you know. So this is also one thing I like to do. This way you have kind of a little unpredictability. If you record this over 16 bars, you know, you can kind of restart it and it has like this kind of interesting groove, like almost like a, a nine over eight, you know? So you can, if you do the math, like after so many bars, only then it will hit the one again. So, or for instance, if I would just simply um, add a bit of um, delay to this now, and I can also do really cool stuff with the, with the delay in this context, you know? I can just send the, the signal to the input. For instance, now I could also take the output from the from the math, it sends a signal every time it reaches the, it finishes the release stage. And I can use that, for instance, to freeze. See now, the envelope controls the freeze of the delay. Or I could use, um, for instance, um, another, um, use that uh, a voltage from the from the Rene that is generated at the same time as a byproduct and I could use that for instance to control the feedback you see you can get all kinds of little grooves going on so this is like just like, you know, playing around and then you do something, oh, what happens if I plug this in there and then all of a sudden you go on a completely different trajectory. So this is, I think, a really cool way to make music. I really enjoy that a lot. And then just going back to the question also, I could really, for instance, then play this, lock individual stages, you know, this is the so-called latch mode. So when I touch a create these little kind of riffs that keep going and so this way you can also have interactive control over so it's a cool way to just play around and see where it takes you okay so that's frequency modulation clear for everyone awesome let's move on let's see what we got next ah we still have the final section we actually just let me patch this up to, get, to give you a feel what we could also do with this. So now, for instance, what I do is I don't use the voltage from the vocal buck in the FM bus, but instead what I do is I use it here to control the mod bus. And this basically allows me to have individual control over these colors of, of, of the timbre. Now the, the white knobs basically, the blue knobs determine the value that, it's, that I'm setting this to. Yeah, this is the this is static. I dial in a sound I like, and you can see this wave falling sounds really nice. 
it's really difficult to get something like this with other means you know this kind of it's the the phasing of the of the signal and overtones going up and down and now the cool thing is what the woggle bug is sending in here i can determine with the white uh, uh, knobs how much to inject Right? All of a sudden you get this completely different shifting timbre and it can also be super inspiring just to listen to this and then pick out parts, cut them up, resample them. So this is, this is uh, like one of my favorite features, you know, to be able to have a bit of randomness in a controlled situation and then deciding myself what I want to take from that. Yeah? And just um, because I talked about wave folding earlier, I also have an oscilloscope reading of this because it just looks really beautiful. So this is what wave folding does. So this is the regular sine wave I showed you earlier. And now once, this is what happens when folding is. That's why it's called wave folding. See, it gets to the top and then it folds back onto itself. Just also, it's visually like a beautiful process. Right, back to the uh, sim sim simple sine wave. And there's like a real kind of, um, yeah, it has the, the signal, the sound, and there's certain symmetry. You can see also the different shapes you can generate with the, with a um, with a final waveform, so you can get really interesting overtones just with one, just a few degrees on the knob will give you so many different colors. You know, mm -hmm. this is the shape here, for instance. And they're all dependent on one another. So all these three knobs. Mm -hmm. It's like, depending how you set them up, the sound changes completely. It's not that it's like a continuous process where the sound changes, but it's all interrelated. Okay, so that's wave falling. We can skip to the next. All right, so that was the DPO. Any, any questions at this point? Just the very simple basics. It's like two oscillators. They can frequency modulate one another, and you have this final output that allows you to shape the sound in a very intricate way. Now the next thing we're talking about is function generators. I think we got a we have no signal at the moment. For the other guy. I, I have a silly question. Yeah, sure. So what were you doing before Rene 2? So before <laughs> Rene I had Rene 1. Yeah, so how, how did that work out in the system? So it's the, the I mean it's single voice. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So basically the difference between these modules is that one has the, the first iteration only had like one set of voltages you could get out. So you had like one quantized voltage, one unquantized voltage and two gate signals. So for this I would mount the signal, so I would copy it and then kind of find ways how to further, you know, delay certain pulses mm. or I had to like, uh, I had like a, a precision adder, which is a module that allows you to add and subtract voltages. So then I could for the second voice get some variations, but it wasn't as intricate as the Rainy 2. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I'm really glad that they kind of worked uh, on, on that concept. Yeah. Okay. Can you see somebody's shoes? <laughs> is it that? <laughs> Very good. Right. Give me your hands. Yeah, but I can already talk about function generator. It sounds a bit esoteric, but in essence, that's what Buchler also called um, uh, the module that would generate envelopes. An envelope is basically um, a non-cyclical function, so it means it starts and it ends, and this allows you then to kind of have a shape. Right? You can say, I want the va va value to go up like this and down like that, and you determine the time between these two. This is in essence what a function generator does. There's the more popular version that everybody knows is the ADSR envelope. It's the attack decay sustain release. It's a four-stage envelope. And what the function generator does is really just two stages. You only have attack and decay. Or as they call it, in this case, it's rise and fall. There's different ter terminologies around that. <coughs> and maybe we just switch to the next, because then I have the very first function generator, again, and Don Bukla. He's, uh, he's been like the, the man in this field. This is like a very early one is a quad function generator, but you can see already these blue knobs on the left, it's attack and decay. So you only went for these two stages. And he was more interested to kind of modulate these values, to not have them static, but play with them. You know? Maybe. Let's have a look at the next one. Because this is the mass. This is the one we will look at in a moment. And this is the overview. 
And again, it might look a little bit intimidating at first, but I also, let's break it down into sections. So let's look at the next slide. So this is the left channel. So it basically it's a two channel function generator and they both operate alike. So on the top you have two inputs, you have a trigger input and you have a signal input. And trigger input basically it's expects a short uh, a, a trigger signal plus five volts I believe and this will then set the process in motion which you can control with these, through, with these three uh, knobs. So you have a rise, you have a fall and you have um, a, a knob to set the the, um, the way how the, the attack, uh, the, the rise and fall react. So if it's logarithmic, linear or exponential. Yeah? Then you have the possibility to cycle it. That means when you press that button on the top left, attack, when, once the decay stage ends, it goes back to the attack stage. So it's pretty much like an LFO. Yeah? Only that you can design, design the shape of the LFO. It doesn't have to be a, a sign or a, a, a try, but you can, depending on how long you make the attack and how long you make the release, you can then have like very interesting LFO shapes. And what's really cool about this one as well is it sends on the, on the bottom, you see this EOR, it sends out a trigger at the end of the rise. So when this, when it goes through the rise phase and it's at its highest point, it sends out a trigger signal that you can also use very, for very interesting purposes to get information out of this that you can use for other, you know, also use to step through a sequence or something. So that's a cool thing. It's all musically interrelated. Let's have a look at the next one. This is actually just for those who were not good in, ma in math mathematics like I was. This is how it looks like. This is a logarithmic curve, it's an exponential curve, and that's a linear curve. So it's good to have this in mind when you're dialing in because, for instance, if you have a filter sweep, then first it will sweep slower and then in the end it will go fast. In the logarithmic function, exponential is different. It will go fast at first and then slow towards the end. So you can also use that for, for musical purposes. Okay. Now the right side or the channel four, or the channel, yeah, channel four, it's identical to the left one with the only difference on the bottom right, it has the end of cycle. So this doesn't give a trigger at the end of the rise, but when the cycle is complete. So both are a little bit different and you can use for different purposes. And at the heart of the math, the really cool thing is that you have the, um, the mixer. Can you go to the next slide? So this basically allows you to mix these Info or the, the signals generated by these two um, channels. And it looks really complicated, but it's actually really easy to understand. So the left function is what appears at the very top. This is the channel one. And you can either add positive or negative values. So this is kind of the attenuation. You know, if it's in the middle, nothing comes out. If you move it towards the right, you get a positive value. If you move it towards the left, a negative value. And what you're adding up there or subtracting is available on the bottom. These are outputs. And you can see the very one in the middle, that's a sum output. That's basically all four knobs at the, uh, at the top added together. Then you also have an inverted output. That means it's voltage inverted. If it's a high signal, you get a low signal. And the OR output is really cool because it always outputs the highest signal. No matter what these uh, function generators are doing, whatever the highest signal is, you can get out of there. So you can get some really cool features with that as well. Plus you have individual outputs for these four mixer channels with one and four being the left and right um, uh, function and two and three being voltages you can actually inject into the MAFS mixer. So this way, this is actually also something I've been using in my, in my um, patch. You can have a very interesting way how to play with the voltages with external modules as well, add and subtract. You can get some randomness, for instance, into there as well. And this way also have a very cool control over the um, uh, shape that it's creating. So <coughs> it sounds very theoretical, so I thought I'd also show you a couple of patches just to illustrate the point. And um, just, um, let's see, what's the first one? Can you maybe go to the next slide? Okay, so this is the so-called voltage control transient function. Sounds very fancy, but in essence, this is exactly what we already have here. So, just going back to this patch. <coughs> so what happens here is, we have the sequencer running, and every time a trigger is sent from the sequencer, we go here into the trigger input. Yeah? We learned earlier, this is expecting a short voltage to determine, okay, now when the voltage comes in, let's start the function. And now I have these three knobs, and I show you how they sound, you know. If I turn up the, the, ri the rise part, 
get something like an attack portion to it. If I change the, the uh, uh, fall part, I basically determine the duration of the sound. Right? And this right here, this is the, uh, the response. So this is linear at the moment. This is logarithmic. And this is exponential. Now you can see they all have a little bit of a different vibe. Here you have more of the sound throughout and then just a short spike and here is exactly the opposite. Yeah, so you can actually make musical use of this. And what I'm, what I'm getting out, where I'm, the, the information I'm getting out from the function generator is this check right here. And this is basically always outputting maximum uh, uh, amplitude. So this way I can control the the um, voltage control also uh, amplifier right here. But I could also go to the mixer. Yeah, and this now basically sums up these four channels. And you can see channel one is up to maximum and channel two is up to minimum, which is where we don't hear anything at the moment. But if I turn this up, yeah, you can see the, the result that is added here at the sum is identical to what we get out here. I can also turn this down here and then we have the same thing. I can also add a static voltage. Now it's on all the time, but I could also now subtract, subtract the function. If I move this one towards negative, now it just acts the opposite way around, right? So now we have, normally have like always on, and now I'm just subtra subtracting the function. So this is why this is such a, such a useful tool, because you can do so many different things with it. And as I said, you can see here, for instance, the attack. Every time the attack is f uh, finished, attack portion is finished, we get a, uh, a trigger signal out, which I was actually using earlier to freeze the delay. So I have also means to kind of almost have like a feedback in the system that one part influences the other. And that, in essence, this is what's called a voltage control transient function. Transient meaning is only triggered once. Right? Maybe we can go to the next one. So this is a voltage control triangle function. This is uh, very similar, but the only difference is I actually don't need a control signal. So we're setting this up at the moment. We don't hear anything because it doesn't get any trigger signal to start off the, um, the function. So that's the, the triangle uh, function just is, in essence, a cycling of the oscillator. So now when I press the button, it starts the function, and when it reaches the end of the function, it starts over again. So that's what you would also call an LFO. And what's kind of cool, you can actually, through the response time, you can change the, the speed of the LFO. Yeah, so this is logarithmic, linear. Yeah, so you can get a lot of cool uh, sounds out of this very simple method, you know, and I really like it because it's so much more intuitive than having an LFO and setting up the rate. You can just have the function, you can also change the shape, you know, if I do it like this. Get this really odd rhythm coming out of it. Yeah, so this is a really cool tool to get really interesting sounds just with three knobs. Okay, what else have we got? Envelope follower. That's a, that's a, um, I think I actually have to skip this one, but it's also one application of the math. You can send in an external signal like a drum loop, and then you can make this follow the loop and then change other parameters based on the amplitude of this. But it's a bit difficult to set up, so I don't want to take you all too long. So drone oscillator, that's a really cool application. I liked it a lot. Because we talked earlier, the only difference between the LFO and the regular oscillator is the uh, frequency. So at the moment when we are tr when we are triggering this, what we're actually hearing, I'm just going to take out the the DPO, and now actually we're monitoring the math. Yeah, so we're actually hearing the control voltage it creates. So now I'm setting this to cycle, and I'm monitoring the um, the sum. I have this one turned up all the way, and now you hear actually the individual. Um, uh, the individual um, cycles of the control voltage. This is normally used to change the volume, right? But what's cool is, the shorter I make this, it becomes audible. 
So it also becomes an oscillator, you know? And what I, what I kind of like to do with this, as just kind of an, a machine to generate ideas, I just cycle both of them. And you can get these really amazing drones going. I can, for instance, then also use a little bit of randomness and maybe change the fall time. And now I'm just using a bit of random voltage from the Vogelbug. And this changes over the fall time the pitch of the, of the oscillator. You can get some really heavy tones out of this. This really shakes. If you would see the speaker cones, they're moving like this now. You get some really heavy work. Yeah, so there's also an application normally you wouldn't think of that. This thing can also make sound, right? Because it's only supposed to create um, information to process or to, to change other, or to provide, uh, to change values. But you can also use this very, very much to create really cool, intricate sounds. And if you then, you know, go through the... This is something nobody would expect from a regular function generator, but Mavs does this very well. Okay, cool, that was this. And then what was the last one? Okay, subharmonic division. This is also like a really, really cool trick. So I'm just gonna go back to the, um, the original sequence that we, that we created here. And um, what I'm not gonna do is I'm not going to put the, uh, the output of the oscillator. So I'm just gonna play the the sequence first so that you remember what it sounds like. So I'm taking just a sine wave going in here, taking this one going in there. We need to clock, get this going in, going in there, help us out. Okay, so this is the, the sequence as it sounds. You remember this one, right? It's a very simple sine wave. Now what I'm going to do is, which is also not what it was originally intended for, but it sounds really cool. I'm just going to patch the sum from the math into the second channel here. And I'm going to use this signal. Instead of going straight here, I'm actually going to put it into the trigger input. Now generates is subharmonics. Just gonna mo monitor this one. Basically, what it does is it scans the wave that comes in and then generates sub subharmonics based on this. And you can get some really crazy tones out of this as well. There you go. <coughs> right, it's a very, very strange kind of stuff you can get out of this. But it's just another creative application you can get out of a function generator. So you take an acoustic or like a, 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 an audio signal, patch that in, it scan, it basically every waveform cycle 
triggers the function and then we just listen to the that the gate pulse is generated by this and you get this I wouldn't even know what to describe. There's like a really odd kind of pulse wave going on. But this is also something I really like. If you mix this with the original single, you can get some really interesting like bass lines, overtones. If you do like some, like, um, yeah, something a bit more gritty, this is like a great way to inject a bit of dirt into it. So this is why you should not always take a module for what it's intended to, but just play around. I also just kind of stumbled on this by accident. I was like, hold on, I just, that's the wrong jack, but it sounds great. So <laughs> this is the beauty of modular synthesis. Okay, let's see what else we got. Nonlinear sequences. This is now we're going to get into the Rennie as the last group. So we have something that creates sound. Then we talked about something that creates control voltages to manipulate the sound. And then as a last group, we're going to talk about um, a, a type of module that allows you to generate musical or non-musical information. So nonlinear sequences is a is a kind of new concept. There's not that many on the market. So one, for instance, is the um, ZX1000 from Tip Top Audio. Let's have a quick look at it. Because they all kind of look similar. You always have a matrix of, of, of buttons. Yeah? So as you can see here, it's an array of 16 buttons and then a bunch of jacks. And you don't even need to understand what they do, but you already know you have a way to access musical information that are not limited to the linear sphere. So if we go to the next one, to the Make Noise Rene, this is the one that I really trained on. And I just wanted to first explain the concept of nonlinear sequencing. So I just took a very basic um, musical notation based on four bars, right? So there you have, um, uh, what is it? Four, eight, L 11, 14 notes, right? So normally you would read them from left to right. This is how sheet music was always interpreted. Now, what nonlinear sequencing does, if you go to the next slide, it separates this into individual groups. So now we take this and take each bar as one group. And now what happens is, if you go to the next slide, it arranges this vertically, see? Now you don't have bar two to the right of bar one, but on top of bar one. So this changes everything because, if you go to the next slide, it now allows you to move through the notes horizontally and vertically. Yeah? So the cool thing is you can write a melody with 16 notes, but you don't read them like this, but you read them like that, and then a new melody comes out of it. And that is the general idea behind nonlinear sequencing. So and I'm going to demonstrate this real quick with, with Rene, because this is the kind of core functionality. Maybe we just use the, the sequence that we were running so far. So using the final output, going in here. So, okay, now we got like our gate signal. Okay, now, and let's have a look at the Rene. I think if you go to the next, there we go. So, there's also an overview for you. So, you can see on the left hand side you have this array of 16 buttons, uh, 16 knobs that basically contain the musical information. Can you maybe go to the next slide? I think I have already, yeah, there you go. That's the thing. So this is where you input the notes to be played back when this particular step is reached. Next one. These are only the inputs. <clears throat> so when we talk about nonlinear sequencing, we talk about moving on the x axis and on the y axis. <coughs> Which is why you have two separate inputs for x clock and Y clock, meaning when a trigger is sent to X clock, it moves one step to the right. When a trigger is sent to Y clock, it moves one step up or down, depending if you reverse the direction. But that's a general idea. And that is a really powerful concept because this really allows you to be creative with trigger signals to kind of create very interesting variations of a melody just by sending two individual triggers to, to the X and to the Y input. Going to the next one, please. These are the touch plates that allow you to input information, access submenus, and also uh, kind of play it a little bit, what I showed earlier with a latch mode. And the last one, on the top right, you see these are just the outputs. 
So you have the uh, quantized uh, 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 control voltage, meaning it's adjusted to specific pitches. And then the next one is basically uh, not confined to musical pitches. Plus you have two gate outputs, one when it moves on the x-axis and another when it moves on the y-axis. So it's cool, you can really with one individual clock, you can get four uh, voltages out. Now this is the old Rene, I just wanted to use this one because it's easier to see at first glance. Second Rene is exa exactly the same, only that it adds two additional layers to the, to the sequencer so that you can have more musical information coming out of this. But for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to use a similar to the initial Rene. And the patch we have set up here is already a very good example. <clears throat> because what happens is, we have this clock coming out and then going into the X clock. And now what happens then, if you look at the, at the knobs here, you see, it moves through these lines up until here. Because this, this page particularly here is called the access page. And this is where I define to the Rainy which of these knobs is it allowed to reach. Yeah? For instance, if I go like this, there's only one stage that I'm limiting it, limiting it to, so it can't move. <coughs> now I have two stages. Now it has two stages to move. And they don't need to be adjacent either. You can also go like this. See, now it goes here, there. So it's a bit um, of a, um, maybe a bit confusing if I say it moves also up, because this is a really powerful feature from the Rene. This is a so-called snake pattern. So now look what happens. I have one clock going into the x-axis, but actually it moves. Once it reaches this one, it goes up there. And this is because they came up with this idea, how cool would it be if I kind of trace different kind of geographical routes through this Cartesian system, right? It's called René because it's based on René Descartes, the famous a French uh, philosopher who discovered the system that you can locate a point in a grid of coordinates, right? Who also has coined the very famous phrase, cogito ergo sum, I, I know, therefore I am, so just a side note. But anyway, so they came up with this really cool idea, how about we have like a graphical route through this maze, right? And this is when they decided, let's call it snake patterns. So right now, this is the simplest snake pattern, it just goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, just numerical, and when it reaches the top, it goes down again. Now, in this particular mode I'm in right now, I can choose different patterns. Now watch, if I hit this, I'm now in snake pattern number 2. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to activate all stages. Oh, it's already okay, sorry. Now you can see, actually, it does a thing where it moves around like this, in this kind of spiral pattern, right? And all the notes I'm getting out of this are completely different if compared to the first snake pattern, because the sequence of the notes is different. Yeah, going back to just activating all the gates. On this page I can also determine which of these stages is supposed to send out the gate, right? To trigger the envelope. At the moment I have none. Now I'm just going to activate all of them so that you hear all of these. So, we have all stages active, Rainy can acti ac uh, access each stage, each stage sends a gate signal, opening the envelope, and now let's, we, we check once more the snake pattern. So this is the first one. This, is, this, this could go on like this, but now when I go to the second, you get a completely different variation because it goes through the maze in that particular shape, like a spiral. The third one goes like this, moves vertically through the, through the sequence of nodes. So each of them has like a different, it brings out a different quality in the, in the melody if you want to. And not necessarily in the melody, you can also use these information maybe to uh, control um, something else, you know, in the, in the patch that doesn't necessarily have to do with pitch. You can also use this one to um, change the timbre. Yeah, now I have, depending on the snake pattern,
So it's a super economic way, just with one idea of 16 values, get like millions and millions of ideas and even trigger this live. You know, you can switch between these different snake patterns on the fly and then have, you know, this as part of your uh, writing process. You only have these 16 notes, but you decide when you want to switch to the snake pattern so that it then generates always a different melody or a different kind of um, a set of values. So this is really something um, you know, where I said earlier, I, I'm not really fond of doing a lot of work and being very intricate, but setting up a few parameters and then hearing what's going on and then deciding myself rather what, what is exciting to me and what is valuable to me. So this is just now one way for us to derive, uh, to go through the snake patterns, but of course you could also, for instance, if I use my, my um, octa track now, I could also use the clock from here. So now this is triggering the x-axis and now I could take a slower clock for instance from the um, you see this one channel 6 moves at a slower interval and now I patch this one into the y clock now every second step also goes up in addition to the snake pattern yeah so now it gets really completely different uh, variations again see this snake pattern one was before going always up and down, but now it makes this weird little step in between. And there's much more you can do. So now I've set up one voice, I can do the same thing with the with the Y, so X is one layer of the sequence, Y is another layer of the sequence. So now I can, for instance, get also musical information with the second snake pattern, and maybe I want to confine this one. So I, I, one trick I really love to do is I'm just setting up eight steps. Right now I only have step eight, one to eight. <clears throat> now what I do is I go to the Y page and I set this up to five steps. And now I use this one to generate information to m manipulate the first voice. So for instance, now what I do is I use the CV value generated from the Y. Yeah, it's like a completely, you see when I go to the X page, it's red. When I go to the Y page, it's yellow. So I can set up different configurations. It doesn't change the melody. And now I can take this, for instance, and then change the duration of the note. So I just go to the quantize page, turn it off. And since now this is five steps and the other one is eight steps, they only meet after 40 steps, you know. Maybe patch this to something else where it's more apparent. So you have all kinds of timbres going on and this is just a great tool for if you have a very simple idea to keep it interesting. You know, maybe this is not like the main part in a song but it's something that goes in the background. And just by doing this you have automatically uh, generated something that is musically interesting. And it, you know, the ear is always kind of tricked, like the, the ear thinks, oh there's constantly something new going on. And th this is like a, a great tool to, to keep your, your compositions also, you know, alive when you're working with a computer because you're always locked in. If you don't make the changes, nobody else does. But I just like the fact that with like a little bit of tricking, you can always tell, give the ear the impression something new is happening, right? So this is just, I think, a great, a great uh, tool, the Rene, for with very little musical, uh, uh, how can I say, intention, you know? You don't want to write an opera, but you can very, very easily switch through these different um, snake patterns and have like different um, different ideas straight away coming out of this and this can be just so inspiring I think. Yeah.
So that's the basic principle of the nonlinear sequencer. So don't be scared by all these things. Just understand it's a very innovative way to step through a set of nodes that you decide and then you can tweak it in, in, in really cool ways to get a lot of mileage out of one very simple idea. All right, so I think actually there was a last thing. Do I have something else? Okay, that I showed you earlier, FM percussion patch, and that's it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. So I hope you got some value out of this, and um, if you're a beginner, don't be scared. Just go in, get something that fits your budget, and just experiment, and don't be afraid to plug in the cable in the wrong jack. And I think if you're an expert already, then you, you know that this never ends and you will always find something new and exciting that, that's going to entertain you. And if you have any questions, I mean we can do a short Q&A now, but if there's something that you're really interested in, you can always shoot me a message, Facebook, or I have like a little website you can reach me on, so I'm really happy to um, continue this conversation because it's also really my passion, so I'm very excited that I can meet, meet like-minded people in a, another corner of the world. So thank you very much for attending. Okay, so. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, how much do you plan? Like, obviously, the Octatrack is a lot of pre-planning, mm -hmm. and the modular, you have, you know, you can change things around. How much do you plan, uh, and how much is improvisation on the modular when you're playing live? Right. I would say it's it's. It really depends on the night. Like, if I'm feeling inspired, then I might completely ditch my plans and go to different places. But it's good to have the planning as a, as a backup, as a fallback. If something's not working as intended, you know, you don't get to the point where you are really uh, kind of getting worried and nervous. And this also obviously has a negative impact on the, on the performance. So I, I can go in 100% pre prepared and just play everything as rehearsed. But that's obviously boring. So this is just kind of to build my confidence. And then when I go in, I know, hold on, you don't have to be worried. You know you can do it. You know you have a plan. And then I just go off on a tangent. So this is kind of like my approach. How do you use the state uh, function on the Rene? Ah, yeah, that's actually a really cool um, feature of the Rene that allows you to kind of what, what, what he saw earlier, me programming in these different values and then kind of setting up access for the, for the stages to be accessed, you can have a way to uh, modulate this. So you can save this and then say, okay, let's do a different one, save that one as well, and then you can s step through those the stages. And it's really, really deep. It's very, it's, it's very intimidating at first because you need to remember a couple of button presses so you can get into the separate mode when you when you hit the buttons here and then you have like different kind of ways you can actually set up uh, different states meaning like all the values you set up saved and you have for instance now I would have eight states and now I could actually step through them by um, patching in a voltage here and now you see the yellow light this is basically the the stage I'm right in so I can switch completely between full f like different melodies even pitches and um, ac uh, 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 access for individual stages so this really is like a complete game changer mm -hmm. and um, I, I tend f actually one application what I'm where I'm using this quite often is when I'm playing live with a band and for instance I have like a 16 step note sequence I need to set to specific pitches to match the composition and then I can have maybe four or five different variations of the melody but I can trigger them specifically so four bars this idea four bars that idea and I actually use the Octatrack for that as well because I can in addition to the gate I can also send a CV voltage out here and then this allows me to have like a specific sequence of notes going I don't think this is really how Make Noise intended this to be because they uh, when you see there the application of it is you have just this kind of uh, constant evolving composition that changes and mutates and that, that is also super exciting. But that's actually like one concrete application I found really useful that I couldn't do with the previous Rene because now I have a little bit possibility to store musical information. The knobs on the Rene, they're changing the knob. Exactly. So for instance, now if I, don't, if I don't clock it, you can hear that effect. So.
So for instance now, if I, if I leave this mode, you see? So this is basically each, each of these um, uh, um, points in the, in the matrix I can use to input a specific node de de depending on which pitches I set up here in the quantized page. So you see right now I only have a D and an A. For instance, I can make like a C minor scale like that. I'm just turning the knob, okay. and the knob, and actually you can see it even light up. You know, depending, this is the lowest note I can get. Can you see this blinking? Yeah. This is the low C right now. If I turn it a little bit further, it goes to the E, mm -hmm. F, okay. right? And now, I could and because I set this up to three octaves, this is one octave. Now I have the whole, the whole kind of um, uh, throw of the knob over one octave only. I didn't know you were getting your note information. Yeah, that's right here, and for each of these. That's why, you know, I store a specific node depending how I set up the knob. And this is depending on the quantization I choose. For instance, now if I go to two octaves, I have two octaves of the C minor scale. If I go to three octaves, three. If I go to this one, four. And if I turn it off, it's actually unquantized. And it sounds like that. So you can see, this is like a really cool tool for, um, you know, you just input a few notes that you know you like or feel right to you, you hit start, you deactivate a couple of them, some of them should not trigger a, 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 the envelope, and all of a sudden you have like this really cool pattern going on, this is really minimal effort. So that's, that's um, I think, a super inspiring piece of, uh, piece of gear. With the um, Octatrack, you are only outputting kids to the Hermod, right? Exactly, and audio to the to the um, to the right. input module here. Yeah, but other than that, there's nothing happening. Um, is the crossfader on the Octatrack? Doing anything. I tried to set it up so that you can get like a stutter effect, but it yeah. didn't really sound the way I wanted it. So in the end, I decided to just really leave it for a playback of my of my stems of the drums and the bass. So this is really like a like a tape machine in a way, or like two CDJs. Even though you can do much more fancy things with this, so I only got it like a two weeks ago. So I'm looking for, forward to go more into the functions. And before that, was the pyramid. Or? Before that, I had the Digitect. It's like a, a cut-down version, but the problem is uh, it only has 64 megabytes of RAM. So, for instance, when you saw me play in Tokyo, I had the Digitect, and uh, since the, the memory is so limited, I had to cut up my loops really short, and I had to pitch them up an octave. Because by doing this, the sample got shorter, and then I had to pitch it down an octave in the octave track. So, it was, it was like a very old-school way of working, like how I used to work with the SP1200 just to preserve the sample memory and I could only play eight tracks after the other so then you had to load this to load a new pro project which takes about like 20 seconds so then I had to do like a little improvisation between and then I could play the next loop so it was a bit of a challenge but you know this also as we say like limitation breeds creativity so when I knew this is all I had I had to think of a way how to make it work and it was also an interesting opportunity to kind of challenge myself that way with the crossfader, in theory, it would be possible to like pump out different gates to the Hermod, right? I think so. You could you could change between two different scenes, so you can define different parameter settings and then blend between the two. I'm not sure if it works also for MIDI or only for the audio. I haven't really gotten into this yet, but it's it's an interesting feature. So you have basically two different states, and then you can fade between these states. So my, my what I try to do is like have a a, a, a delay and then lock the delay to specific values and freeze it but it never sounded as good as the echo phone so I have to look a little bit more into that. And there's no reverb there? No, actually no reverb and I had, uh, had reverb quite a while uh, or I used to in the module. No, or I used to bring the, the herb verb to the shows because it's su such a nice sounding, sounding module but I realized the club is, su is so such a resonant or re reverbing environment it, I had to really like pump it up and then it sounded really cavernous and I just, it was kind of like 
a trial and error, I realized there's no, there's no point if I'm playing this kind of live show to have a reverb. If I play with a band or like in a very quiet ambient setting, then obviously I, I need something to create space. Mm -hmm. So I had like different different uh, engagements. Like um, it's usually like that I get asked almost like a session musician. So one one band I played quite a few gigs together with. It's a German jazz guitarist called Max Cloud. He's um, he studied jazz in India, so it's very interesting because his whole band is they're all on off meters and like really odd scales. And he has this interesting guitar on the top. It's like a it's a fretless like almost like a violin. So they they're using a lot of interesting influences on top of like the uh, being very much rooted in a jazz tradition. And <coughs> I remixed them, and then they asked me if I could not imagine to play with them together. So what what happens is like um, I. When we play together, usually like I'm on the second part of the set, so like 30 to 40 minutes, and I generate something like, for instance, the FM patch that I played you earlier. I generate also a click to the drummer. The drummer plays together with me, so we form like a little rhythm section. And on top of this, th that's really when the rainy shines that I can s save, for instance, specific notes into the into the uh, quantizer. So then I'm also able to kind of interact, play with them. I can, as I also showed you earlier, you know, for instance, I have like touch plates in a separate module, like the, the pressure points that allow me almost to play like a piano trigger individual notes. And it's really rehearsed. So the songs have a structure and I need to perform specific parts at specific points. And there's actually a, a really cool um, video online where you could see us play at and a very famous studio in Germany called the Bauer Studios, which was like during the 70s, like one of the top uh, jazz studios in Germany. You had like Miles Davis play there, Oscar Peterson, and like a lot of the ECM records were recorded there. So it's a, it's a really uh, like historical place. And we actually were invited to do a, a live recording there. It's like a similar setting. You have, I think, about 50 seats in the studio. You have one guy doing the front of house mixing in the studio, so for the audience. But at the same time, it's recorded live on quarter inch tape and then they press it on vinyl. So it's actually my very first triple A record, meaning it's recorded analog to analog tape on an analog carrier, the vinyl record. And if you, if you search on Google, you will see a little clip of us playing there. It's actually even with a, a, a little string section, the band, me on the modular. So it's a really, uh, it was a really uh, exciting experience to have that also on, on records, this performance. Mm -hmm. Find a way to searching. You yeah, just look uh, on, on Facebook, it's I am Kabuki, or on Instagram, Beats by Kabuki, you, you, you'll easily find me. But I also have a page, like a landing page, where you find all these um, kind of social sites, so it's called iamkabuki.me. And there's also a contact, you can send me a mail. Stay in touch. The, sorry, last question. <laughs> oh, another question. Yeah. FH1, um, that could do gates too, right? Yeah, absolutely. You so can... You can why Paramount over a second at one? Because... Like the lights are nice. I guess. Yeah, because I had it. Okay. <laughs> I was working with... Uh, with, with yeah, that's the thing. I, I worked with, with Squab for... Um, I did a workshop in, in Tokyo, Modular Festival, about polyphony and the modular system. And this is a great tool to output chords as individual voices. So they were kind enough to, to lend me one. So that's why it's in my case at the moment. But this is exactly as I said, it takes up a lot of space. So. Now for the Octa track, I'm actually looking at a new, a different module that's only about this size, and then I can also fit more modules to play, filter the echo phone and play with the echo phone. So I'm really looking forward to that because for what it does at the moment, it's overkill. Mm -hmm. And what is that other module? Uh, it's called um, Mutant Brain, and it's actually specifically made for the Octa track. So you just plug in the MIDI cable and it has like two voices plus a bunch of gates so it's gonna do exactly what I want to. I just couldn't uh, order it before I came here so I had to use that one instead. All right then, that was a lot of information. Again, thanks for your patience and it was really exciting to be here. Thank thanks you. a lot.